scripture reading before the lesson will come from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. The Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or calmness and when we see him there is no beauty that we should, desp that, that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely has, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised from our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. All, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened, up, opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers he is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with, his, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, was, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for his sin, he shall, see the, he, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by the knowledge my righteous servants shall justify many for he shall bear their iniquities therefore i will defy him a great portion with the great a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul into death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the, the sin of many and made the intercession for the transgressors How much attention do we pay to the songs which we sing in worship? Is it just repetition? We've sung these same songs for so long that we just know the words and they just naturally flow out. In Colossians 3.16, the Bible there says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is a form of teaching. It is a way in which we all teach and admonish one another. Do we really pay attention to those words which we sing? Well, we ought to because they're a form of teaching, because they're a way of building up. When you look at James 5 and verse 13, the last part of that verse says, Is any Mary?" M-E-R-R-Y, let him sing psalms. The singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is a way in which we can build each other up, is a way in which we can put a smile on our faces. It's a way we can express the joy which is contained in our hearts. Now, there should be absolutely nothing that brings any more joy to our hearts than when we realize the sacrifice that Jesus Christ paid on our behalf. Are you a little blue this morning? Are you a little tired? Are you a little run down? Friend, Isaiah 53 ought to send that away. The singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, especially those which uplift the sacrifice of our Savior, friend, we got something to be joyful about. We have something to smile about. We have something to recognize as truly beautiful because nothing is more beautiful. Nothing is more precious. Nothing is more important. And the words that should come out of our mouth should be, oh, how marvelous. Guess what we're going to title today's sermon? Oh, how marvelous. That's the title of today's sermon. And what we're doing is going through some great chapters of the Bible. I'm just this way. I'm sort of orderly, though if you saw my manner of life, I'm really disorganized. 
But in preaching, I like things organized. I like things that way. So what we've looked at in great chapters of the Bible, the first one was Genesis 1. We looked at law. There's a chapter of the Bible in regard to law. It's the first one. Then we looked at the next breakdown of the Bible, Hebrew history, Joshua 1. There's a chapter of the Bible from Hebrew history. Last week, we looked at some, not, not even the majority, but at least some, of some Hebrew poetry from Psalm 119. And today, we're going to look at Isaiah 53. Here is what could be said. The book of Isaiah is the mountain of all the prophets. Now, that could be debated. But if it is true that the book of Isaiah is the mountain of all the prophets, then Isaiah 53 is the mountaintop. It's the pinnacle. It's the greatest of the great because if I were to entitle this chapter, it'd be something real simple. I'd just call it Jesus because that's what Isaiah 53 is about. And incidentally, for those who may not believe that Isaiah 53 is about Jesus, no less than six different passages specifically refer to Isaiah 53 and apply them to Jesus and there are a whole lot more allusions. What we intend to do today is to go through Isaiah 53. We won't bring out everything because there are a ton of things that could be said about Jesus in Isaiah 53. We will talk about some of them but there are four S's that we're going to observe today. In Isaiah 53, 1 through 3, we're going to observe the sorrows of Christ. And we'll see. Some of us have sorrows because we sin. Because we say stupid things. Because we don't think before we speak. Jesus didn't have that problem. His sorrows and griefs were on my behalf and yours. Number two, we're going to observe the stripes of Christ. In Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, the word stripes means hard and intense blows, wounds, welts. You know, they put some nasty marks on him, and I'm going to have a little show and tell and show you something that they may hit him with, so pay close attention. Number three, we're going to see the submission and slaying of Christ in Isaiah 53, 7 through 9. You know, he willingly let them beat on him. He willingly let them drive nails through his hands and through his feet. Would you? And then in the fourth place, we're going to see the satisfaction that was accomplished by Christ's sacrifice in Isaiah 53, 10 through 12. Friend, you can be reconciled today. If you're gloomy, if you're sad, it's your fault. It will be your fault if you walk out of this assembly today gloomy and sad. And only yours. Now, that's what we intend to do. Let's get started. Let's look at Isaiah 53. As we get the first point of our sermon here, that is the sorrows of Christ. We'll get a little historical, then we'll get a little practical. The Bible says this in Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report? That is a prophetic type. That is quoted again in John 12, 37 and 38, and also in Romans 10, 16. Here Isaiah is saying, who's believed us? No one's believing and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The arm of the Lord is another term for the Messiah. To whom has the Messiah been revealed? Whomsoever will. For he shall grow up, Luke 2.52, before him, that's the Father, as a tender plant. Jesus was something precious. He is something precious in the eyes of the Father. And as a root out of a dry ground, that may have some reference to Nazareth and him growing up poor. As a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Do you realize if we were to see Jesus in his physical body amongst a, another group full of Jewish men of the day, we probably couldn't pick him out of the crowd? There was nothing special, evidently, about the physical appearance of Jesus. The Jews had a mistaken view. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to be this great big tall man. He's going to be... So dashing, he's going to be this, that, and the other thing. And then here was Jesus, a carpenter. The son of a carpenter, raised up, basically poor. And when the Jews saw him, they didn't get it. Just like some today. Verse 3, he is despised. That is, he's viewed as worthless. And rejected. That is, he's forsaken. John 1.11, he came unto his own. And his own received him not. 
man of sorrows. And you see the word sorrows here. That is pain. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Grief is sickness. Both of these have to be in regard to Jesus' emotional state. It was not that Jesus was grieved and sorrowful because he beat his wife. Or he screamed and yelled and cussed at somebody. Or he stole something. Or it was nothing like that. He was grieved over everyone else. He was sorrowful over the condition of the world. A bunch of people who didn't care. A bunch of people who were more concerned about everything else physically in this life than the spiritual things. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Do you know why that is? Some people really understood how precious Jesus was and it made them ashamed. You know, shame is a terrible thing. Shame will probably send as many people to hell as any other sin because we cannot get over what we've done. We hid, as it were, our faces from him, and we esteemed him not. Boy, the sorrows of Christ were not over his wrongdoing, but he was so saddened over sin. Now, what's a practical application of this? Do you realize when we reject the gospel of Christ? We reject Christ. Some of us say, I love the Lord. I'd do anything for the Lord. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And you'll deny that. You'll say, I don't have to be baptized to be saved. Do you realize when you reject his word, you reject him. You turn him away. We think sometimes, oh, if we only saw Jesus in the first century... I'd run up and hug him and do everything he said. No, you probably would. We'd be like the majority of people. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But let me give you the opposite side of that. Romans 10, 16, Paul says, For they have not all obeyed the gospel. For it is written, Who hath believed our report? So when we actually do obey the gospel, we are believing their report. Do you realize when we accept and obey the gospel of Christ, that is how we accept Christ. When we hear, when we believe, when we repent, when we confess, and when we are baptized, immersed in water in order to be saved, we accept Christ. Oh, how marvelous. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that wonderful that in spite of all these things, in spite of everyone rejecting him, someone will get it right. I intend on being of that someone who gets it right. What about you? The sorrows of Christ. Now, number two, let's talk about the stripes of Christ. The word stripes, as we'll see it used here, means hard and intense wounds, welts, bruises. Now look at verse four. Surely he, that's the Messiah. Who's the Messiah? It's Jesus. Surely he hath borne our griefs. That is, he's lifted them. He carried them. All the punishment that was due me was placed upon him. Surely he hath borne our griefs, that is our sickness, and carried our sorrows. That's our pain, but it's our spiritual pain. It's our emotional pain. Do you see that? Are you a wreck today? Are you messed up? Are you burdened down? I know someone who will carry that away. Won't you let him? Surely he hath borne, lifted off our griefs, our sickness, and our sorrows, our pain. Yet, in spite of that, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. How is that? The same way we reject the gospel is the same way we reject Jesus. Verse 5. But he was wounded. When you see the word wounded here, it means pierced through. He was wounded for our transgressions. Does the Bible say he was wounded for his own transgressions? No. Mine, our, that includes Isaiah. He saw it. He was wounded, pierced through for our transgressions. He was bruised. Bruised does not give all that word. That word means totally crushed. He was crushed. Yes, his body was afflicted, but his spirit... He took on all our burdens. How do you feel about your own sins? When you sit there in the dark of the night and think about the things you've done, how do you feel? 
Imagine doing that for everybody. Do you see that? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised, crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes, hard and intense wounds. I got here for you. You see this here? This is called a Roman flagrum. The Romans didn't invent this, but they perfected it. It is something along this line. You see that? That's lead. It's got some nails. It's got some chunks of glass. The Romans perfected it. Some people call it a cat of nine tails, but this is a little different. See how that keeps it separated? You can work on a man and work on a man and work on a man, and all the blood won't get stuck up in that. It won't stop it. Now, you think you're tough? Let me hit you with this. Let me peel your clothes off and strike that across your back once. Do you realize the New Testament says it very simply? He was scourged. This is what they did the scourging with. This is what put stripes on him. Do you see that? Why were those stripes put there? They were not put there, friend, because of his own sin. They were put there because of mine. They were put there because of yours. Does that not do anything? Is there a soul left that that doesn't bother? It should very much so. But what does it say? With his stripes, we are healed. 1 Peter 2.24 makes it clear. That healing is a spiritual healing. It took him suffering physically to heal us spiritually. Isn't that crazy? And sometimes we still don't even care. We still won't give him our best. We still won't obey the gospel and get out of our sins. Look at verse 6. Oh, we, like sheep, have gone astray. Not just some of us, all of us. Qualify that. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Babies haven't sinned. Young children haven't sinned. But sooner or later, they will. All of us are going to stand at some point in time in need of a Savior who took my stripes. What will you do? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. When you see the word laid on him, it means struck him with. In 1 John 4.10, he is our propitiation. He's our substitution. He died and suffered on my behalf. Do you know the Bible teaches that? We get so caught up in work. We get so caught up in trying to make a dollar. We forget this. This is what matters. Is there an application for that? I think so. Why were the stripes laid upon the fleshly body of Jesus? Let us never ever forget. He was innocent and I'm guilty. He was innocent and you're guilty. You lied. You stole, you cheated, you fornicated, not him. All of us did it. How do we treat him? Like a dog sometimes. He brings us spiritual healing. How does he do that? By our obeying the gospel. Does that not? Oh, how marvelous. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that wonderful? Number two, the stripes of Christ. Now, number three. Isaiah 53, 79 here, we'll see the submission and slaying. They killed him of Christ. They didn't just beat him and strap him. They killed him. He was oppressed, Isaiah 53, 7. And he was afflicted. Is that what the Bible says? Yet he opened not his mouth. Boy, he allowed himself to be punished. Can you imagine having the authority and the ability to call more than 12 legions of angels? And annihilate this place. Can you imagine that? Having that power and authority and willingly going and taking on the beating of the whole world. Boy, that's something, isn't it? He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He did not repay insult for insult. You know, they spit on him. They spit on him. They beat on him. And how did he act? He didn't bow up on them. He didn't swell up on them. He didn't pull out a ninja move on them, did he? He submitted. He did what was right because he saw the big picture. Yet he opened not his mouth. He has brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, that is silent. So he openeth not 
his mouth. John 1, 29, John the Baptist saw it. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin, the whole sin of the world. Do we see that about Jesus? Verse number 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off. The Hebrew word here for cut off always, every single time, brings the idea of a violent death. Don't think that it was just calm. Don't think that it was nice. Don't think that those Roman soldiers took it easy on him. They uncorked on that man. They went off on him. For what purpose? For my benefit, for your benefit, for everyone's benefit. He was cut off, violently killed out of the land of the living. It almost brings the idea of a flower. You know when you go pick flowers? Do you go pick a flower before it blooms? Probably not. Do you pick a flower after it's bloomed and already began to wither? No. You pick a flower right at its peak. That's the idea. When Jesus was at his peak, they cut him off out of the land of the living. Here it said again, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. My people here, when you look at it, Maybe has an idea of the Jews, but when you look at Genesis 1.27, every human being is made in God's image. God is the father of spirits. Therefore, he is the father of us all. Acts 17.29, for we are the offspring of God. So it wasn't just for the Jews that Jesus died. It wasn't just for the righteous that Jesus died. It was for everyone. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked. Was he not crucified between two thieves? And with the rich in his death. Was not Joseph of Arimathea a rich man? Indeed he was. Because he had done no violence. You see how submissive our Lord is. Here we are a bunch of rebels. Here we are a bunch of fighters. Here we are a bunch of backbiters. And yet he did no violence. Neither was any. Not the first lick of deceit was in his mouth. Now, practical application. For what purpose yet again? What purpose exactly did Jesus die? Why exactly did he die? Do you realize he died for me? We could say, well, Jesus died for the whole world. Man, make it personal. He died for you. He died for me. He died for me so that I might have life eternal. He died for you so that you might have life eternal. Do we see that? 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Jesus suffered for me in my place. You know who should have been beat with that? Me. You know who should have had nails driven through his hands and feet? Me. Not him. But you know why? He knew I couldn't do it. He knew I couldn't live how I needed to live in order to qualify to get there, but he did it. Number three, we see the submission and the slaying of Christ. Brethren, they killed him. They killed him. But now number four, you know there was some satisfaction that was accomplished by this. And to the ignorant, to the unlearned, they'll say, bro, that's awful, man. You're just beating on a person, killing them. They're bleeding all over everything. What are you talking about all this blood for? Why are you bringing up here stuff like this? Let me put it on this side so this bunch over here can see it and stare at it for a little while. Why are you putting up stuff like this so I can see it? So it will impress the truth on your minds. You need a Savior. You need somebody to help you. Verse 10. Yet, in spite of all that, yet it pleased the Lord. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Same word, crush. It pleased the Lord to crush him. How so? He, that's the Lord, hath put him to grief. Why? Because there had to be a plan in eternity. Jesus is that plan. When thou shalt make his soul, now underline this, an offering for sin. Jesus did not literally become sin, but he became a sin offering. He was offered acceptably to God on my behalf. When the Bible speaks about him taking on our sin, he took on the punishment due for our sin. The Lord was not the worst sinner ever. You may hear someone say that. His soul was an offering. He was a blemishless, spotless lamb offered for my sins. 
It hath pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. This is in regard to the resurrection. Friend, it doesn't stop at the death and the burial. He got back up. He shall see his seed. His seed is spiritual Israel, Galatians 6.16. The Israel of God is the church of Christ. Without his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, we would have no church. We would have no blood-bought people. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. There's no doubt that's about the resurrection. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. If I were to offer myself as a spiritual offering unto God, it wouldn't satisfy the Lord. You know why I tainted myself with sin a long time ago? You don't qualify either. You know why? You tainted yourself with sin a long time ago, more than likely. And if you have not yet, you probably will. Just watch and see. But thanks be to God, even though we can taint ourselves with sin, something and someone loved me enough to get rid of that and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant. That's Jesus. How do you miss that? Justify many. That is justify the many. Every single person who desires to obey the Lord's gospel can be just if I had never sinned. You can be washed clean from the tainting your soul of sin. He'll justify whosoever will. Romans 1, 16 and 17. He shall justify many for he shall, there it is again, bear his shoulder up under their iniquities. You don't fight this battle alone. Do you realize that? You're not alone. You don't have to fight all by yourself. Someone will help you in his name is Jesus. Verse 12. Therefore, conclusion based on evidence. Well, I, Jehovah, defied him a portion with the great. You realize Jesus is numbered amongst the greatest. And when you look at Philippians 2 and verse 9, he has the name exalted above every name. And all of us, one day, will say, that's the king of kings. That's the Lord of lords. My advice is you better do it in this life. You better get it right here because you'll do it in eternity. Get it right now. Divide him a portion with the great and he, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Why? Because he hath poured out his soul unto death. Why did he pour out his life, his soul unto death? Because he loves me. Because he loves you. Oh, how marvelous. Isn't that marvelous? And he was numbered with the transgressors. That's applied directly to Jesus, hanging there between two thieves. And he bare the sin of many, literally the many. He bore the sin of everyone. He tasted death for every man, Hebrews 2, 9. But not every man will obey that gospel. Not every man will do what it takes to be reconciled to God. And made, literally, he keeps on making intercession for the transgressors. Hebrews 7, 25 and 1 John 2, 1 and 2. Now, what's the practical application of this? We entitled this point, Satisfaction. How, how is there satisfaction? You know what the satisfaction is? Reconciliation. Easy definition of the word reconciliation. Make friends again. You and the Lord are not friends. If you have sinned. It sin separates us from God. We cease to be the Lord's friend when we start sinning. But by Jesus Christ, by his sacrifice, by his blood, we can be made friends again. Does that not mean anything to anyone to me? It makes me want to say, oh, how marvelous. That's wonderful, isn't it? That I have done so wrong and somebody would forgive me of that terrible wrong in spite of everything we've done. What have we talked about today? It's a great chapter of the Bible. There's a whole lot more that could be said. But we boiled it down to this. The sorrows of Christ in Isaiah 53, 1 through 3. The stripes of Christ in Isaiah 54, 53, 4 through 6. The submission and slaying of Christ in Isaiah 53, 7 to 9. And the satisfaction accomplished by Christ in Isaiah 53, 10 through 12. Do you realize Jesus died for me? Every day we wake up from here long, on, we need to say, Jesus died for me. 
He died for me so that I might have life. Don't make it impersonal and say the world. Make it Brock. Make it your name. Make it personal. And see if that doesn't change our attitude and actions throughout the day. Love is an action word. And love is something that must be demonstrated. And Jesus demonstrated his love for all mankind in Isaiah 53, 700 and some years before he did it. Isn't that amazing? Indeed it is. He paid a debt he did not owe, and he paid my debt I could never repay. What must I do? How do I demonstrate my love and devotion to God? How do I show him? Yes, we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, but i got to start somewhere. There has to be conviction in my heart. I have to believe Jesus died for me. He died on my behalf, Acts 16, 31. I have to believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God. Once I see that he died on my behalf, I have to change my mind in regard to sin. If I've been lying, i got to quit lying. i got to make that right. If I've been stealing, i got to quit. i got to make that right. That's called repentance, Acts 17, 30. It's commanded of all men everywhere. What must I do? Acts 8, 37 teaches I must say, I must make that good confession. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Will you do that? But will you go all the way? Will you meet his blood? Acts 22, 16. And now why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Are you burdened down in your conscience? Hebrews 9, 14 teaches it's only the blood of Christ that can cleanse your conscience. 1 Peter 3, 21 says, And the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience. Oh, God. Baptism will cleanse your conscience. Are you having trouble sleeping? Make it right. Do so now, as together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.